Hey guys, welcome to my channel. I hope you're all doing very well. So I just watched Loki episode six. Let's talk about it. So first of all, before we even get into anything, before we even get into any discussions on that, on what just happened, okay? I just wanna ask one question. Um, Marvel, how do you expect me, okay? How do you expect me to continue on with my life, with my regular scheduled programming, my daily routine, after you literally dragged me by the throat with that season finale? How am I expected <laughs> to continue on like nothing happened the following day when I'm literally just been dragged by the neck? I've literally been dragged by my edges. How am I supposed to handle this and go about my day after watching that season finale? I'm genuinely asking. But yes, I did just see the season finale of Loki and we are going to try and delve into my thoughts and feelings on the season finale of the show as well as taking a look at the series overall and me giving you guys my review of the show as a whole so yes if it sounds like it's going to be a lot to get through me trying to cram in two different types of reviews in one video that's because it is <laughs> and also considering how much I like to talk okay talky talky just like Mobius says I think it's best that we press on as soon as possible but before we delve into that as per usual if you haven't already please be sure to subscribe to my channel and make sure you turn on your notifications so that you can be told when I upload next. Now without further ado let's get into my thoughts on Loki episode 6 and the series overall. So first of all this episode starts off pretty magnificently. We get this beautiful sequence at the beginning of this episode and we do also have this voiceover with a bunch of sound bites from different characters within the MCU and later on in this sequence we do also hear the voices of real life figures like real life historical figures like Nelson Mandela and Maya Angelou as well as real life current important figures like Greta Thunberg which was fascinating to hear it was kind of connecting the MCU into the real world there perhaps suggesting that the implications of what happens in this episode is supposed to tie into our lives as well and again I ask Marvel how am I supposed to continue on <laughs> after seeing this season finale but anyway so we do have that beautiful sequence at the beginning they're just really tying in the themes of the universe the multiverse okay how all of these individual lives are connected we also hear um the song that's played at the end of Avengers Endgame when Steve and Peggy are dancing together um back in the 1950s so again it's just tying in all of these themes of space and time that connect to the characters and the themes that we have seen throughout this show but after last week's episode where we we saw the Lokis manage to defeat Elias, they have finally found themselves at the end of the Yellow Brick Road and there are a lot of Wizard of Oz references in this series and in particular this episode but they find the end of the Yellow Brick Road and manage to get to the Emerald Palace I think it's called um, but essentially they manage to get to the location of where the creator of the TVA resides and they have this little cute moment at the beginning there where they're you know trying to figure out how to approach things and there is a call back to episode three where Sylvie says to Loki like you're not gonna tell me uh, not to kick down the door and he says listen this is not the time <laughs> this is not the time for my input because he can see that the nerves are high Sylvie is about to meet the person who created the TVA and therefore was the reason why she was on the run for the entirety of her life pretty much so tensions are very high right now and he recognizes that and so he's trying to be reassuring trying to give her the moment to kind of process everything before they can even decide what to do about the door situation the door opens for them and then out comes Miss Minutes <laughs> we do have that jump scare from Miss Minutes and her eerie orange glow really does emphasize the kind of evilness of the character in this scene but she comes up to the two Lokis and offers them these kind of dreams like these fantasy realities where they can both coexist in the same timeline even that's not supposed to happen but you know she would allow it for them because he can make it 
happen and she also promises our loki the throne like the throne of asgard midgard you know wherever you want to rule you can do so like all you have to do is turn around and not get into any shenanigans okay don't ruin the tva and what he has set up with the tva and with the uh, sacred timeline that's all you have to do just but out of it just leave it alone but no the loki's are like mm, this is sus <laughs> this is bizarre now a lot of people online reminded me <laughs> so thank you internet a lot of people online reminded me that there were sequences in the trailers that we didn't actually get to see ultimately throughout the series and one of those sequences was the kind of king loki sequence where he's sitting on the throne of asgard or like standing in front of it in his full loki gear we didn't actually end up getting that scene or that shot and so a lot of people have kind of theorized that maybe that was supposed to be slotted in here during the scene where miss minutes is kind of you know laying out the fantasy the dream that they could have if they just let it go and i feel like that would have been a pretty effective visual way of showing and representing what was on offer before the two turned it down but you know in the end we just get basically two different environments in this episode and essentially we stay at the citadel at the end of time or we go back to the tva um there are a few places that we visit elsewhere but for the most part that's where we stay so perhaps that's how they wanted to keep it or maybe because of time restraints or something to do with covid we weren't able to see the completion of that scene and that's why it was cut but i feel like it's cheeky teasing us with that scene of loki you know being in front of the throne because that's something that a lot of people were excited about so to not have it on the show at all is a little bit disappointing but after turning down miss minutes's offer the loki's continue on down the hallway we get to see more of the citadel this kind of castle slash palace slash manor like building and i really like the way that the building seems to be constructed out of this like weird version of marble <laughs> we've oftentimes seen buildings like this that are constructed of white marble take for example any greco-roman structure of importance but i like the fact that here the marble is like black and the veins are golden and you can see these various different colors again it plays into the idea of these kind of branches and these different branches of timelines splintering off i think it's a really cool visual motif but as the loki's are going through our loki does make the observation of just how run down the place is okay even though the construction is very beautiful it seems to be quite run down we don't have a lot of maintenance here and so he suspects that perhaps the person who was originally here has already died but before we can even delve into different theories about what happened to who actually lives here we get to the elevator and in this series elevators have been incredibly important another important motif throughout the show we saw it in the tva itself with the elevators with the hourglass figures that also look like infinity symbols and they were supposed to lead up to the timekeepers and then we find out that the timekeepers aren't real but in this case the elevator doors revealed to us the actual creator of the tva and it's mr jonathan major <laughs> <laughs> it's mr guys oh my goodness i was freaking out okay listen just a little uh behind the scenes moment here okay i'm currently working from home so i watch these episodes of loki during my lunch break and i'll just be sitting there in my living room watching it i flipped out <laughs> I flipped out. I wasn't ready to go back to work after this episode. Are you kidding me? I flipped out when I saw Jonathan Majors. I was like, oh my god, it's Jonathan Majors, like screaming out loud like an idiot. Like my neighbors must think, you know, what's going on in there. But I was flipping out. Let let's talk about the fact that we officially got the entry of Kang in this episode, despite what I said previously. Okay, let's talk about this because yes, I was kind of wrong when I said that it would likely be a low who was the creator of the TVA but I just want to point out <laughs> I just want to point out that I did also mention in my previous reviews that even though it was possible that Kang would be the creator of the TVA the problem with that reveal is that to leave it to the end of the series the final episode it would mean a ton of exposition would be needed in order for us to understand who Kang was because at the end of the day even though we are kind of in the know about Kang and about these comic book references because we're here on YouTube talking about it or watching videos about it the majority of Earth's population that enjoy Disney Plus don't know who Kang is and so the issue that I had with revealing that Kang was behind it all along um, at the 
end of this series was that a lot of people would be like okay but like who is he <laughs> like okay but like uh i don't know who he is so why is this a big deal so i'd actually be interested still to see how people who don't know who kang is and don't really know lots about the comics actually reacted to that reveal because i don't think they had the same visceral reaction that i did <laughs> listen i was just done praising him in my video about the emmy nominations for 2021 so to see him here just put the biggest smile to my face but yes going back to what i was saying about the ton of exposition needed in order to make kang make sense um i was kind of right <laughs> even though i was wrong about it being a low-key behind the tva i was still right about the kang option needing a ton of exposition because guess what this entire episode was just exposition and even though i did paint that as the worst case scenario in my previous review i do think for the most part Part, they carried it out very very well and it's it's because of Jonathan Majors' excellent performance isn't it it's because of his just incredible almost effortless charisma the way that he portrayed this version of Kang we'll talk about it in a second is very charming it's almost like childlike um he's a bit silly he's a bit awkward he hasn't been around anyone in a very very long time he's been alone up in his castle ruling over these timelines so you can tell that he hasn't had any interaction with people in a while and his mannerisms reflect that he's kind of quirky I loved Jonathan Majors' portrayal of this character or at least this version of the character so so much so yes we do get that scene in the elevator slash lift where Sylvie and Loki are still trying to kill him listen can we just talk about the audacity of it all <laughs> <laughs> like they've essentially met God okay we'll talk about the religious connotations of this series later on but they've essentially met God and their first reaction is let's stab him am I the only one <laughs> who's thinking like hmm, uh, I don't know what that's about okay like the audacity to think that you can stab God like the God of all gods the person who made the TVA to begin with like stab it really anyway <laughs> but he proves rather quickly why he's so difficult to kill because of course he knows exactly what's going to happen he knows how things are supposed to play out because he has it all in a neat script and so yeah he's able to evade all of their attempts to stab him until of course he gets bored with their little game in the lift and he manages to get to his office before them and he greets them in the office with a cup of coffee <laughs> with two sugars okay and then he settles down at his beautiful desk in order to tell his story and like I said the majority of this episode is exposition but it's delivered by Jonathan Majors so you forgive it <laughs> because he has that charm he's eating an apple again that plays into the religious connotations like for example you know the apple or the pomegranate or whatever fruit it was um in the story of Adam and Eve um and how this was the apple of knowledge I feel like that very much plays into his character considering that he is all knowing and on top of that of course there's this trope of characters in movies and tv shows eating apples to show how much of a douche bag they are and I feel like that also applies here. Now let's discuss some of the exposition that Kang reveals to us in this episode. Now I feel like this episode is absolutely crucial if we're going to get a better understanding of what's to come for the rest of phase four of the MCU. I mentioned in my review of Black Widow that I felt like that film didn't really belong in phase four of the MCU. It felt like more of a phase two film but this series definitely feels like the opening of phase four especially when it comes to the multiverse corner of phase four with what if with spider-man 3 and with doctor strange multiverse of madness i feel like this very much feels like the show that was setting all of that off a lot of us believe that that could have been a wonder vision and her trying to open up the multiverse and that's why we perhaps got fox's version of quicksilver but no no <laughs> instead we got the Ralph Boner joke again we'll never get over that <laughs> but this series didn't disappoint this series didn't pull a Ralph Boner it gave us exactly what we were after and it set up beautifully the idea of Kang the involvement of Kang in phase four of the MCU so first of all what we learn about this version of Kang is that he is a variant and the original person I guess that we're following the story of even though technically they 
all existed at the same time um but the central focus is this version of kang that existed in the 31st century on earth and he was a scientist who discovered that there were multiple universes that were stacked up on top of one another aka the multiverse all these different timelines now what's interesting here just a side note is that it is a bit confusing to know whether these timelines are the same as multiverses i'm assuming that they are and synonymous with one another because otherwise the idea of there being different timelines and each timeline having a multiverse is like insane but maybe that's exactly what they're going for it is after all called multiverse of madness um but i'm assuming that the timelines and the multiverses are synonymous but you guys let me know if you think that's not the case but anyways he discovered the multiverse and was able to develop technology the portals that we see throughout the series in order to traverse around those multiverses and at the same time the other variants of him also made that same discovery so initially they had their like interactions like it was cute like it was narcissistic but cute okay like i like your shoes i like your hair but then of course inevitably they've stumbled across a variant of themselves that wasn't quite as benevolent wasn't quite as cheerful and he was out to conquer and of course we have that direct reference to kang the conqueror from the comics and soon after that the multiversal war that miss minutes warned us about in episode one broke out because all of these various versions of kang were all out for multiverse supremacy <laughs> i guess and in the end it's our version of kang that we meet in this episode who had to use Elias in order to destroy these other multiverses and then create a one sacred timeline in order to bring order to the universe and so what's really interesting about this is it goes back to those religious themes that i mentioned earlier um but this story very much sounds like something you would hear out of the book of genesis right like in the bible it definitely feels like kang is portraying himself as like a benevolent and all-powerful god someone who was able to bring order to the disorder to the literal chaos that existed previously because of other versions of himself and i think that that definitely ties into the religious undertones of the tva as an organization as a whole uh, which in a previous review i said was akin to a religion <laughs> and because of people's kind of blind faith in the dogma and in you know the belief that the timekeepers had created them and they had a specific purpose that they needed to follow and the timekeepers had laid out that purpose there's no need for free will when they have already established what you're supposed to do and there's this idea of you know predeterminism versus free will that has run throughout the series i feel like that message was lost a little bit along the way but this episode definitely brought it back in a big way and it seems as though this theme is going to be pervasive throughout phase four of the mcu and that's very very exciting to me and like i said this is a very exposition heavy episode so we do get some visual cues okay some cute visual demonstrations of the story that kang is telling us in the form of these like metal blobs <laughs> that turn into solidified versions of himself like miniature versions of himself on the table he also takes breaks in order to eat his apple essentially it's just jonathan majors chewing up the scenery and you know using his mannerisms using his facial expressions giving us something interesting to look at because we are kind of stuck in this room throughout the entirety of this episode at least on their side of the story and i also did notice that whoever was helming the camera in this episode was doing doing the lord's work <laughs> doing the lord's work in order to give us these kind of different angles pushing in the camera giving us a close-up of him then pushing back in order to make it feel more dynamic because again for the most part it is a very stationary sequence but after kang has explained the whole situation the two lokis are still skeptical of course you know we're dealing with the god of lies so they believe that everyone is lying especially someone who was able to create the tva and subjugate okay let's not forget subjugate all of those people in order to work for him and um, with this blind faith in this false dogma of course they're going to be skeptical of what kang is saying but i have to say okay let me just take a break here to lament okay speaking of lamenters let me just take a break here to lament on how much i dislike the character of sylvie before we even get into that end okay before we even get into that because it annoyed the hell out of me that she was like oh you're a liar to kang like oh i don't believe you you're a liar the whole time she's just kind of buzzing in her chair waiting for an opportunity to stab him and again i go 
back to what I said earlier. Like, why are you trying to stab a God? Did you not hear what he said? Did you not hear? Like, I know she partially doesn't believe, but like, you can see where he's living. <laughs> Like, like you can see his surroundings i just got so frustrated by just how small-minded this character was already i was frustrated by the romance that developed between the two lokis which i'm really not a fan of not because it's a bad idea but because the chemistry isn't there for me personally so i was already upset about the character in that front but then you have the fact that kang is talking and she's interrupting with you're a liar loki's listening at least like <laughs> loki was paying attention but sylvie's just there waiting for a chance to kill him it really did frustrate me and there is a scene there is a moment where Jonathan Major says exactly what I was thinking throughout the entire series pretty much and especially this episode where he's like Sylvie grow up and I was like preach to the choir <laughs> preach to the choir I was sick of it I've had enough like okay I understand she was on the run for all of her life blah 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 you're literally sitting at the end of time beyond the end of time all you can think about is your life can you not see the branch literally outside of the window that determines the lives of trillions of people in the universe really and even Loki tells her later on he's like like this is not about us this is bigger than us and she still doesn't understand it drove me insane <laughs> And then Kang also mentions something else that I was thinking about the whole time. And that is that they're all bad guys there. How is Sylvie sitting there with all of her self-righteousness with a whole sword in her hand, ready to stab this man, literally ready to murder someone. Meanwhile, Kang is telling her like, uh, you're a hypocrite, you're a murderer, you're a liar yourself. Like you've done horrible things in order to get ahead, in order to survive. You can't be telling me someone who managed to save the multiverse from a multiversal war that was going to end everything. You can't be telling me that I don't deserve to be in this position I'm a liar blah 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 when you were looking out for yourself and you created havoc madness chaos everywhere you went the whole time when he said that the whole time when he was like admonishing her for being a hypocrite I was like yep <laughs> I was like someone needed to say it so yeah it definitely put a smile to my face when Kang put Sylvie in her place because she was doing too much she was doing way too much but ultimately Kang's little spiel creates a whole different split because even though he was intending on hiring them both <laughs> <laughs> like it's kind of like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory I think a lot of people have made that comparison as well but it's like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory especially the Johnny Depp version where Willy Wonka's like yeah I'm tired I don't want to do this anymore so Charlie even though you are wholly underqualified <laughs> unqualified entirely I'm going to put you in charge of my factory I feel like that's what was happening in this scene where Kang is just like you know what I'm really tired Loki like I've been doing this for a long time I look young I look great because black don't crack but inside my brain is mush because <laughs> i've been doing this for way too long so i'd really appreciate if you guys just picked up like where i left off that would be great <laughs> if you could just you know you passed all my tests okay it very much felt like applying for like a training contract for law <laughs> we have to pass all of these tests <laughs> you have to do all of these interviews and then finally they got to the end the interview with the partner of the law firm the founder of the law firm and he's like yeah you guys have the job but then they argue amongst themselves because all of a sudden Sylvie doesn't agree with Loki's perspective Loki is kind of swayed by what Kang is saying not really because he fully believes Kang but because he's worried about the consequences of killing him and honestly like I just it frustrated the hell out of me that Sylvie couldn't see this perspective like it really did I understand that it was important to have these three distinct perspectives be represented in these scenes but it just drove me insane how small minded she was like it's not about you sis then then they have their little scuffle <laughs> then they have their little sword fights which you know was fine i still maintain that this series has not had the best action sequences especially when it comes to like hand-to-hand -hand combat i was also somewhat disappointed by the magic on this show in particular when it comes to loki because you know for the most part he was using it for trivial things like fireworks and drying himself but then there were moments where he would like lift the whole building <laughs> like stop a whole building from crashing to the ground i don't know i felt like it was quite consistent and it it didn't give me enough of the Loki you know the powerful sorcerer that I thought he would be especially considering once again as I said previously he challenged Doctor Strange once upon a time like in Thor Ragnarok he challenged Doctor Strange he was ready to take on the Sorcerer Supreme but with the skills that we see in this series 
I think not. <laughs> I think he would have just embarrassed himself, quite frankly, in that duel. Once again, we do see some more pitiful magic in this action sequence where Loki uses his to pull Sylvie and Sylvie uses hers to push him about. Um, you know, fine. <laughs> We're done now, I guess. Let's just wrap this up. We already have Kang. I already have what I came here for, so we'll just wrap this up now. They have their little fight and then Loki is like, please, like, I care about you, blah, blah, blah. They kiss, but it turns out to be a Judas kiss. Again, another religious reference. Before for uh, Sylvie pushes Loki through a portal back into the TVA and she ultimately kills Kang herself and Kang's just like see you soon because he already planted the idea that reincarnation is a thing at least for him so like again why is she so hell-bent on killing him when she knows or I guess she doesn't believe him I guess but jokes on her he's gonna come back <laughs> Jokes on her, he's gonna come back and not just a variant of him, but maybe even the exact Kang that we met in this episode. So yeah, Loki lands in the TVA and he's just heartbroken, okay? His girlfriend slash other version of himself <laughs> just broke things off with him in the worst way possible. She was like, it's not me, it's you. <laughs> it's you are the actual problem because we disagree on free will and whatever. <laughs> you do get that quiet moment where the camera just pushes in on Tom Hiddleston's face and my guy my guy has been doing the actoring all of these episodes like just all of these episodes but of course in this scene we have this mixture of emotions the heartbreak that Loki goes through this is the first time we've seen the character genuinely hurt for an extended period of time like usually he just brushes it off he continues about his day causing mischief but here like you could see it cut deep that betrayal cut deep and of course you know it's a Loki that did it to him but he really didn't expect it and it's because cause of that kind of conflict between these characters where you have a character who literally cannot trust anyone because she's been running for her whole life and she's had to depend on herself in order to survive from the TVA but then you also have the character of Loki who's known for lying <laughs> like he's the god of lies so it's somewhat similar to the idea of you know the unstoppable force with the immovable object so now that Loki has found himself at the TVA let's talk about some of the scenes that took place in this episode at the TVA with the characters of Judge Renslayer and Mobius because yes we do see Mobius return to the TVA but he's been busy <laughs> he has wasted no time because he has let the rest of the TVA know that this is all a lie <laughs> this is all a lie there are no timekeepers Judge Renslayer was lying the dogma is false and everyone seems to know about this information because when Judge Renslayer calls for a hunter to come take Mobius away no one comes <laughs> because they're all disillusioned with the lies that they've been told and we do get I believe the only sequence that takes place outside of either Kang's castle or the TVA itself and that's this kind of time jump back to 2018 where we get to see where the pen that Judge Renslayer has been using throughout this series actually comes from we get to go to Roosevelt High School I believe it's called um where Hunter B-15 has hunted down Judge Renslayer in her natural habitat as a teacher but she has other hunters from the TVA chasing after her she's kind of on the opposite side of things at this point in time but she manages to convince one of the hunters to just wait a minute when they arrive at the office and lo and behold we have Judge Renslayer and I believe the um kind of degree certificate that was behind Hunter B-15 called her Rebecca something which is a reference to the comics she has an alias in the comics um of the same name so this version of uh, Judge Renslayer is called Rebecca and we don't really get to see a lot from her outside of that she seems quite affronted to see these random strangers in her office so they have a similar personality to begin with but we don't really get to see much of her um, after that sequence and then going back to our version of Judge Renslayer she has an interaction with Mobius where she expresses how disappointed and how let down and betrayed she was because Mobius seemingly decided to go along with the Lokis instead of believing in her and their friendship you know for all time always that's a slogan that the TVA has and it's something that she seems to have lived her life by and thought that Mobius was also applying to their friendship but she feels betrayed when it turns out that that's not the case and then they also have a bit of a scuffle before ultimately Judge Renslayer is able to defeat Mobius but she doesn't kill him instead she heads off to find free will now 
Now this might be a reference to a memo, <laughs> to some information that she managed to get Miss Minutes to dig up for her. Perhaps Miss Minutes, you know, intentionally put that information on her lap because of what Kang, you know, any version of Kang told her to do. It seems as though she is someone's sidekick <laughs> in this whole equation. Okay, she's working with the bad guy in some way. So she has selected the information to give to Judge Renslayer in order for her to pursue free will. But unfortunately, Mobius's quest for free will <laughs> may be short-lived because after the events that take place at Kang's castle, Loki returns to a completely different TVA. We see him running through the TVA, okay, and he finally manages to find Mobius. And, you know, Mobius and Hunter B-15 are talking about all of the branches, talking about, you know, what's happened and why has he allowed this to happen. And then Loki reaches them and he's like, it's a disaster. He tries to explain everything that happened um, over at the beyond the end of time. <laughs> I keep trying to call it the end of time, but it's like beyond the end of time at the Citadel. And then Mobius is just looking at him like, who are you? Like, you need to calm down. Like, you're an analyst, right? You need to calm down. What's going on, sir? And Loki's looking at Mobius all defeated. Like, what do you mean? You don't know who I am. <laughs> he already feels so betrayed <laughs> after what Sylvie did. And now Mobius can't recognize him. Like, his friend can't recognize him. It's an awful day for Loki. But then he manages to look out to the window where we used to see statues of the timekeepers. And now... <laughs> Now we see a statue of who else but Jonathan Majors as classic Kang. Kang from the comics in the classic purple and green outfit. <laughs> and it is just a sight to behold. First of all, I just have to say, I love the way that the statue recreated his hair, like his Afro hair. That's just, that's such a nice touch. <laughs> I can't wait to see Jonathan Majors don this costume soon <laughs> at some point in time in phase four of the MCU. We already know that he's going to be popping up in Ant-Man Quantumania, but perhaps Perhaps we'll see him sooner. I mean, after all, Jonathan Majors himself said that he had no idea about what was going on in Loki. And now look, <laughs> look how that turned out. So we could see him pop up anywhere and like i said i feel like this series has done an excellent job in opening up phase four of the mcu and its exploration of the multiverse so now that i've gone through my thoughts on episode six of loki i did just want to touch on some overall thoughts on the series as i mentioned i feel like the performances in this series were excellent tom hiddleston was doing the actoring the actoring i feel like he would be wholly deserving of an emmy nomination himself unfortunately it seems as though the series maybe too late for this year but maybe he could get one next year who knows but I think he would be wholly deserving of that because he carried my man carried this show <laughs> on his shoulders okay he did such an incredible job portraying this version of the character and whilst I have come to accept that it's not quite the same version as the one that we got in 2012's Avengers even though I had believed that that's what we would be getting or at least a version of Loki that was closer to that but ultimately he did seem more like the Loki that we ended up with in Thor Ragnarok just before he died because they kind of cheated and <laughs> showed him the events of um, his life leading up to his death and so that's kind of how they shorthandedly recreated that version of Loki but I feel like that's kind of beside the point because the whole point of getting 2012 Loki was that he's supposed to be evil and he kind of wasn't but anyway I'm over it I'm over it <laughs> I think Tom Hiddleston did a great job nonetheless and the cast overall was excellent I mean you have Owen Wilson making this incredible entry into the MCU along with Wumi Musaku who I'm a huge fan of and I was so happy to see a uh, present in this series and another Lovecraft Country alumni in Jonathan Majors which just brought a huge smile to my face he was incredible in this episode and I can't wait to see him act out these various versions of the same character especially Evil Kang oh Evil Kang is going to be delicious. So yeah, the cast was excellent, but I also wanted to highlight something that was particularly incredible about the series, and that was the score. I think Natalie Holt, who did the score for this show, is a genius. 
is an actual genius. I've mentioned how, you know, the score, the theme that this series has is very reminiscent of like Doctor Who in some elements. And of course it has, you know, these time motifs playing throughout it. But I just feel like the score of this show is hands down the best score that we've gotten in all of these Disney Plus series. And finally, I got such a kick out of seeing the different versions of Loki. It was so fun, especially in episode five. And even though for the most part, I wasn't the biggest fan of Sylvie, <laughs> who was the variant that we were stuck with for the majority of the series, seeing the different versions of Loki in episode five kind of made up for that. And I wish we'd gotten more of that. If only the series was like 10 episodes long instead of six. Like I just want more. I just, <laughs> but speaking of having more, yes, we did get that confirmation in the end credits scene of this episode, confirming that we'll be getting a season two of the show and I'm just delighted. I'm ecstatic because I feel like of all of the Disney Plus series so far, Loki a thousand percent deserves a season two to explore this huge world or multiple worlds <laughs> of possibilities that it has introduced into the MCU. So with all of that being said, I'm going to be giving Loki the series an 8.5 out of 10. But that's it from me. Now that I told you guys my thoughts on Loki the series, it's time for you guys to let me know what you thought of this series down in the comments below. Please be sure to subscribe to catch new videos coming up. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. And I will see you in the next one. Bye.